I always liken it to being the captain of a massive ship versus a small boat. It's easier to, you know, row on your own. And then once there's people relying on you and all the rest of it, it always feels like the Titanic could sink at any point. Today I'm speaking to one of my favourite rappers ever. Music was simply a stepping stone for this phenomenal individual, G Fresh. Hey, so obviously, you know, it's always a bit weird because we're actually friends yeah. for us to have to do an intro and for you to find out how fond I really am of you um, and how impressed I've been witnessing your journey from so early on to now. Um, I think what I really want to do is kind of just have a really open conversation with you. Mm -hmm. So G, coming from, where, where is it that you come from? Um, I was born in Nigeria, I was born in uh, Madugri. Um, I came to England when I was about five, I think. Um, lived in a few places, then settled in Clapham on an estate called Pointer's Estate. Um, from there, moved to Brixton Hill and then from there, moved to Croydon, Thornton Heath. Okay, so not the most affluent parts of town, no, then, then, at no. least. No, not the most, but they were fine. I, I drove to my old estate literally two days ago, and I drove round the estate, and it, it was a lovely place to grow up in the sense that I learned a lot there. We had sad times, great times all sorts of stuff. I think it was very crucial in forming who I am today, I'd say. The reason why I ask that is because, obviously, we spoke a bit about, you know, you, your education piece um, yeah. and the fact that you were really smart. Um, so I don't want it to get lost that you actually did come from um, a, a background that wasn't typical um, yeah. for someone who has the success that you do today. I think it's really important to be able to communicate that. I have to put that down to my mum. My mum pushed me and as I said watching her work and even the school for identifying that I was a bit quicker than some. Okay, all right. <coughs> like, yeah. um, yeah. So what are the key parts about discipline that you learned and how if you had to teach your younger self without you going through the process that you did, you know, without the schooling, etc., how would you break that down to yourself in terms of okay, this is how you discipline yourself, G, young Gordon. I remember when I was 11, the first thing I asked for for Christmas was an organiser. Most people would be too young, but they were these like little computer pad things and it had like a little screen and you flip up and it just made me feel I important. remember them, I definitely didn't yeah. have one of them. <laughs> yeah, My so mum was not getting me that. Yeah, so I asked for that and then I got one of those and then that's how it kind of started. Then I always had a diary and I've kept all the diaries so I can go back to years, look, open a day and see what I did. How many of your friends had one of those? No, nobody. Right, so um, this is what I'm trying to trying to grasp. So even though that this seemed almost natural to you, yeah, and, and everybody went through the school system, everyone had a, a, yeah. a, a homework planner or whatever yeah, it is, yeah. but what was it for you that made you tick that, you know what, I want this diary, I want to organise myself, I feel like I need to organise myself? I, I don't know. It was just, for me, maybe it was the fear of school. So you come to school and if you haven't done something, you're in trouble. That, that was what I, th I think I can distinguish between saying my school and maybe some others, is that if you haven't done something, you're in trouble. You can't come to school and say, oh, I haven't done it. I haven't done the homework or I forgot it or this. You're going to get punished for it. So you was working on the human instincts of, we're more likely to move away than f from fear than towards pleasure. Yes. For me, that's kind of, I know it sounds crazy. It's just kind of how it worked in my house. I kind of was... I mean, my mum wasn't a tyrant, but I was, I was scared of my mum. I, I mean, she was a lovely mum, but I was still scared of her. Like, if you can't just go and take a biscuit, you have to ask, do you know what I mean? And you, it was, yeah, I was, yeah, I was scared. Because there's real punishments in, like, <laughs> in my household. You, you mess up, you're going to get punished, like, and that's... Whether that, because it's funny, we He's talk not about, going to the dungeon. He didn't get no, sent to, no, the dungeon, to the dungeon, guys. But, but we're talking about even like African punishments, like stand up. I mean, kneel down, hands up, face the wall. You sit there for half an hour. You're a kid doing that. These are stress punishments that they <laughs> use on on prisoners in Guantanamo Bay that they banned. <laughs> but these are the punishments that we got 
as African kids. You said that you came here when you was five. Yeah. So uh, how was that for you? Because obviously that's a, a, a big change, a big transition mm -hmm. um, from Nigeria to, mm -hmm. to the UK in, in general. Um, and obviously that there's, there was a lot of differences, um, including, I'm assuming, an accent. Yep, yep. Um, so, you know, the usual African bubble this and all the rest of it. So that gives you a tough skin, that kind of gives you a fighting mentality, that gives you a need to prove yourself. Then I remember... At first, I would like get in trouble for trying to answer all the questions in class. So it's like, then they tell my mum, can you tell him to not put his hand up as much? So that, <laughs> that, that was one of the reports. I, I believe in pressure and competition. That's kind of how I operate, because otherwise I'll rest on my laurels. How, how, G, like, how did it happen? How did, how did G Fresh materialise? So music started for me after uni. Initially, I was just more of a academic, essentially, through and through. I was a bit of a, not, not a geek in the truest sense, but a geek at school and a person that just loved learning. So I did like my sets and all that stuff early. I was in like the year above and blah, blah, blah. Then I got a scholarship to, so I went to a, a state school first and I got a scholarship to a, a private school, Dulwich College. And then there, it kind of just opened my eyes to things I hadn't seen before as far as people with money. And I think that's where it made it very real that it was possible. I think I, I started rapping from an arrogant perspective, to be honest with you, just because I felt like I had a story to tell. So I was a rubbish rapper at the beginning, but I felt <laughs> like my story was more valid than anyone else's. So from there I started rapping, blah, blah, blah. Started getting a... I gained a love for it and a desire to want to be one of the the people that people would talk about. And that's where being G Fresh, I suppose, comes from. We're seeing that you did a rare thing. You made being really smart cool because your economics, et cetera, came into play because they helped you to develop your persona. Yeah. Um, and your I understanding of, of money um, that... A lot of people from, I guess, from your area probably didn't have. Am I right in thinking that? Yeah, mo most people didn't. I think you had a basic understanding of one plus one equals two okay. minus your cost is your profit. Everyone understands that. But I think in terms of building out economies of scale, just understanding and applying business to right. anything. When I started, we didn't make any money from music. So I, I realised I'm just paying this person to do this, that person to do that, that person to do that. Whether, whether that was CD production, whether that was going to a studio, whether that was making a video, merch, all of the rest of it. So I said, OK, I'm not making any money from this. So I need to become all the people that I'm paying. So then I started pr pressing everyone's CDs. I just bought loads of burners. People would pay me and I'd literally sit there, put CDs in 10 at a time, pop out, blah, 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 stick the stickers on them. I'd order them from like Vistaprint or whatever and they stick all these stickers on, da, 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 da. Produce their CDs, package, give them to them so they could then sell them and all the rest of it. Then I started my clothing line, Fresh Freshwear, and then would also produce other people's clothing and mail and distribute all their clothing. So I did GRM's clothing for a time period when they started. Then I started a production company to shoot everybody's music videos. So we shot from Tinchy to Wretch to Getz to a whole plethora of artists at the time. So, and that is what basically gave me the network to, to infiltrate the scene coming from South London, coming from a place where I didn't do grime and wasn't a part of the scene to then becoming a part of the scene. Just going back to what you've just said, you were talking about, you know, you all this multitasking you was doing and it yeah. already tired me out just at the thought of all those different elements mm -hmm. you had going on. And I remember seeing you on set, like really doing a lot. Um, how did you manage that? Because you always had a really good team. Mm -hmm. um, so delegation was a, a strong point for you. Um, but then how were you actually like physically doing that? How were you, how were you breaking it down in your head? So discipline, I think, is the most important thing that we can have as human beings in terms of chasing any goal or trying to achieve anything. So I just work, that's just what I do. I wake up and I hit my laptop 
and everything else is in between. See, I'm the complete opposite. For, for me, it's like, it's very organized chaos and it always has been. From, from my studies, from like, I was always the person who was writing their essay on the last day. But you say that, but you're always working 24 seven. I see you emailing 24 seven. <laughs> so it's just, that's, it, everything else is kind of, it's, it just becomes part of you rather than a separate activity. And it's the same thing I try to um, teach my daughter because you can work while having fun. You can do an hour here, have your fun. Hour here, have your fun. Hour here, have your fun. It just becomes part of what you do. Once it becomes part of what you do, it's, it's kind of easy. Whereas a lot of people go to work, finish work, leave work at home, and enjoy and then separate the two, which is cool for some people. Okay, but when you're working on your own schedule at the beginning of your journey, that's a little bit yeah. easier because you've got a lot more time to fill these, these gaps in, right? Yeah. Once you started touring, mm -hmm. yeah, and doing music stuff, what was your first taste of money like in, in yeah. doing something that you enjoy? Because I think that that's always really important. I think it just gives you the, the confirmation that what you're doing is possible and that it can grow. It's exciting to receive any sort of money from really and truly any form of hard work. And normally the harder it is to, to gain the money, the better it is when it comes. I wouldn't say we were like vastly successful musically. We did okay, but I don't know, you'd have people around me like Tiny, who further down the line was getting number ones and doing all of this crazy stuff. So it made it even more possible for me to, to believe was achievable. Yeah, and from groups that are generally undervalued, it's like, actually, look, we've been accepted into something, mm -hmm. so we're allowed yeah. to. Similar to what you said earlier about, you know, we were just excited that people were going to pay us anything for music. Yeah, yeah. I'm almost feeling like I'm an imposter because you're going to pay me? Oh, yeah, no, I had, sure? impos I had imposter <laughs> syndrome the whole time. This isn't fair. This can't be right. Something, I'm going to get caught out at some point. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's, I honestly felt like that for ages. And I think specifically because you had the book smart element as well that wasn't... Um, now it's a bit different because people are, you know, more open mm -hmm. to all types of, of rappers. But yeah. I guess if you weren't from a certain background or doing certain things, um, then it, it doesn't make sense. Of course, and, that, and I, I felt that too. I also felt imposter syndrome because I had options, I felt. Whereas everybody else was like, this is all I can do. This is all I know how to do. And I never felt like that. So I always felt like, eh, am I... I'm cheating the system a little bit. <laughs> and eventually that's kind of why I ended up stopping making music because I got to an age where I was like, this is okay, but this isn't all I can do. Which was devastating. Alfie was an amazing body of work, but Thank you've you. heard this argument from me. Every, sometimes <laughs> I just hit him up because you stopped making music and I really enjoyed Alfie, but cool, we'll move on. But yeah, it really upset me. So let's segue into the next part of yeah. your journey. When was the moment where you felt like, actually I can cross over and how much did music play a role in those opportunities of, of the doors opening for you? Yeah, I think music was everything. I think it allowed me to leverage my other talents. It, like, it shone light on my other talents. With the ladies, you were a bit, oh, look, look, the discomfort comes. And you're, no, Sham, don't do it. Don't talk about the women. Yeah. Um, but the girls loved you, G. Like, what was the G Fresh thing? There was a G Fresh <laughs> effect that happened. And um, being a bit of G Fresh's arm candy was a bit of a big deal. So talk me through that. I mean, I don't know why. I mean, I, I just think, to be honest, I think I'm just, I'm just a nice guy, honestly. But you're also very flossy and very, like, cool and very... But I'm not, I'm not flossy in an... In an I, OK, making music and rapping about it is, is flossy in an, an obnoxious way. Uh, yeah, and very arrogantly, obnoxiously rapping about yes. it, yeah? But in real life, I'm quite a chilled... But do you think that that was deliberate? Because it was like, actually, in the music, I've done all this. But look, in real life, I'm cool. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think, feel like it was. No, I think, I think it just, that's just naturally who I am. And I think music just allows you to explore a side of yourself that would probably seem uncomfortable to relay in, like, normal conversation. Yeah. To, to yeah. be honest, I never actually had any one person come and say, like, G Fresh is a dick. Yeah, like, that's it. I'm just a nice guy. I mean, if I, if I met you today, and this is our first encounter, and you thought, okay, I want to get into venture capital, uh, I want to work with you, Charmaine, mm -hmm. like, how would you approach me? Because I, if I didn't know you, so I don't know you, and this is something, you're like, oh, you know, you're great at this. Like, Anytime I've had to do that, it's because I've just had a good idea. 
I've never come empty-handed in a way. Um, you know, people always ask, like, what traction do you have? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there, there's a, there was a point of, of your life before even G Fresh where Gordon had to go and pitch for something somewhere. Yeah. And you just had to say, actually, I don't have the experience, mm -hmm. but I have... The, and the dot, dot, dot the, is what I want to get from you. I had an interesting conversation last week where somebody was basically asking me what... I was going to bring to the table and it, and it was because they were based in America it was difficult to describe because everywhere here I'm me and like you kind of half know what I can bring to the table so the first time I felt like I was having a job interview and I was a bit like um I'm gonna <laughs> and then but then it was just easy once once I sat there and remembered what and who I am it was pretty simple and the main thing I brought to that conversation was ideas and things that they hadn't thought about Okay, so those differentiators are sometimes really important. Um, yeah. So I, if I go into a room um, in my industry, it's very white male and, and older male, mm -hmm. um, business uh, working class and businessmen. So for me, I'm like, actually, my, my offering is that I am the complete opposite of you mm -hmm. and we will never think the same. Exactly. And I have an alternative um, perspective. Exactly. So I think it's just a really, like, for me, just kind of unearthing that. Um, as someone who's a, an artist, a musician, you, you then go to manage other acts. Mm -hmm. So how does that feel like being able to put yourself in their shoes, like really meaningfully um, understanding who they are and what, what they are? I mean, I do the similar thing when I, as a fund manager. Mm -hmm. When I invest into a startup, I, I feel like I, I have a credibility and an understanding of them that other investors may not have because I'm like, I've been you. Yeah, yeah. I get it. Like, how does that feel for you? I'm driven a lot by the fear of failing, essentially. So give me an example of where that worked as an artist manager. So for me, I had been through everything they've been through, first and foremost. So the main thing was teaching them not to make all the mistakes I made, because looking back in, in hindsight, I could see all the things that I probably could have done better. It so happened that the, the artist I was looking after being Young Bane, we were quite similar in character. So essentially it felt like there was a, a, a younger version of myself. So one of the first things is that he's, he's a very intelligent individual and, and he, he listened to me when I was younger. So his initial approach would probably be to be very complicated in his writing. And that's what I did naturally because I was smart and I wanted to basically, essentially, I felt like looking back, I was just impressing myself. <laughs> with how crazy I could make a double entendre or a metaphor. But in reality, after reading a Dale Carnegie book about public speaking, there's no point in overcomplicating for the layman because they don't understand what you're saying. So if you're trying to rile up a crowd, you're going to probably find like shorter, more poignant slogans to get their attention or get them going. And so it was teaching, for example, or making him understand that simplicity is the best form of communication, first and foremost. And I didn't do that. So that's an example of, yeah, me trying to instill those. And then in, in terms of being able to remove yourself, like, do you ever feel like, you know, your, your act's going on stage and you feel like that, that could be me? Because you still, do you still have that first for, for the crowd? No. That's what, yeah, no, no. That was what was weird about me and music and all of these things, I, it's the imposter thing. I was there because I could, I, in all honesty, I feel like I could learn to do anything. And I know it sounds no, really I get you, bad, I get you. but I honestly like, I just learned to be a musician and I did it. So that's really important, yeah, because I feel like a lot of people who were very creative across the board, mm -hmm actually end up kind of in, in a worse situation than those who are, have a very specific, I can only do this, this is what yes. I do and I do it well. Because they end up like, oh, I can, I can draw a bit. I can, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I can sing a bit, I yeah. can dance a bit, yeah. I can write a bit. Yeah. So they do lots of loads of different things. And, and then they say that talent, hard, we, hard work beats talent. Mm -hmm. So how did you push any of those things through if you were good at everything? Not everything, but yeah, everything just by trying to be even better at them. 
that's but how many at a time, G? I know you've got your time list discipline and all of that stuff going on, but like <laughs> you, it, like it gets gets overwhelming. There's some days like my phone will ring and I just like can everybody just not call me? It's the only person who oh, yeah. called me that day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay, yeah, that that still happens. Okay, that's normal. But the passion part, I think, is the one of my teachers when I was young. I had a thirst for knowledge. Whatever it is, I'm going to learn about it. Initially, I thought discipline is basically, which I think it still is, is being able to do what you don't want to do. Having the drive to do what you don't actually want How? to do. The passion for whatever that outcome is, mm -hmm. is what's going to allow you to find the discipline for me. Okay. Because when I found it, in, during the pandemic, I found I wasn't that passionate about much. And that's the first time in my life that I didn't feel an innate drive in myself to do whatever it was. Thank you, Gordon, G Fresh, for being you, um, for giving us amazing music, even though you stopped and still beefing you about that, <laughs> just small, small. Um, thank you for sharing with us your journey as a whole and for being an inspiration to us. Mm -hmm. um, definitely have inspired many, including myself. And I guess you'll continue to. Um, I'm gonna lift this glass, the to toast with you. Cheers to you. Let's get lit. <laughs>